Hi, I'm Michael. And I'm Ross. We're dementia researchers. And we also love old cars. In this series, we're going to interview some of the brightest minds in the dementia field. And we're obviously going to do that in old cars. Let's go for a ride. Today's guest is William Jagist, who everybody knows as Bill. Bill is a professor of neuroscience and public health at the University of California, Berkeley, and he is a true pioneer in using different neuroimaging techniques in order to study the aging brain and dementia disorders like Alzheimer's disease. He's also a true petrol head, and even if he's got a love for cars from southern Germany, he still is very American. So we got him a true American classic. That is one sweet ride. That is a sweet ride. What do you think? I think I get to keep it, right? Yeah, it's yours. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love it. What year is this? 60? 67? 67. Oh my goodness. It is beautiful. I saw guys oogling it back there. You get a lot of attention. Oh, the guy closed the boot for us. Oh, he closed the boot. Yes. <laughs> oh my goodness, look at it. It's just fantastic. Oh, wow, look at the steering wheel. This is, this is a special car. Well, we're gonna, oh, do we go get coffee? Is that, is that, is that, yeah, what, we're, we're, we're gonna do? We'll go for a ride first. We'll go for a ride, okay. You wanna jump in? Well, on that side. I have to get in the back, actually. Oh man, look at this, look at, oh my God, it's like a, it's like a boat in here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go it's for a ride. Right. Oh, I don't have my seatbelt, am I gonna get arrested? I, I didn't have one, I, I don't have I'll, one. I'll be all right. So. Okay. Oh, I think an old car, I don't know I don't about think, I don't think we're gonna go very fast. You might what? be surprised. No, <laughs> <laughs> no so uh, in, in Sweden, if you have an old car, you, you're not required to have a belt. I this must have a, you know, the one thing uh, you don't get with this uh, uh, is that you don't get the smell. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, yesterday... It has a nice we... exhaust uh, emission. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, listen so, to that. Listen to that. Oh, my God. It's having... <laughs> it, it looks like a boat. It sounds like an airplane. I, I was going to... And it's, it, sounds like it's, it sounds like it's drinking the, the... You call it petrol. It sounds like it's drinking the petrol by the... <laughs> by the you know, it is. Gallon. It does. Yeah. Do you, do you enjoy driving it? Is this is this an? Yes. It doesn't seem like it's really very. It, it's kind of. It's not really a peppy car. Yeah. No. It's definitely. It's got loads of power. It's not. It's actually not that fast. It's though. got a lot of horsepower. Yeah. Probably not that much torque. Yep. Did you? It's a V8 engine. Is it yeah. In, yeah. Of course. It's got. It's got to have one. Yeah, so these things are monsters once you get them going. Oh, so, can Bill! You smell that petrol. Yeah, it really stinks. Why did you pick this car? Oh, uh, this is an icon. This is an iconic. Is it, first, I'm an American. I'm an American icon. <laughs> <laughs> and this car is an American icon. I mean, there's no, you know, there's very few cars that are, that have the, that were designed and made in America that have the cachet of a 1960s Mustang. This was the this was the dream car of many a youth, including myself. But wouldn't you? I mean, you live in California now, but wouldn't you agree? It is a bit of a Californian dream as well. But sure. you're actually an East Coaster. Yeah, I grew up in the East. I grew up in the East, but you could always, you know, the California lifestyle was so, um, you know, pervasive. It sort of became the American lifestyle. I mean, you grew up in in uh, New York, and you still wanted to surf, you know. So why not have a Mustang? <laughs> But you never owned one. Yeah, I, no, I never. I would, to be honest with you, I'd never buy a car, car like this. It's, it's like, it, well, when I, you know, when this car came out, I was, uh, well, you can guess my age. I was like, you know, 15, right? So I was not ready to own a, a Mustang. <laughs> uh, my, my, we didn't have the means to. I never had a car until I was, you know, uh, employed. So, um, so I would never have had a car like this. But, um, but you, you are a petulant. So did your, did your car career? 
change from the East Coast years to the West Coast years? Well, you know what changed is I started to have the salary. Because <laughs> <laughs> when I was on the East Coast, I was doing all my training and you know post uh, medical training and stuff like that. When I moved to the West Coast, I started to you know get a salary. And so the first car I bought when I moved to California was an Alpha Spider. It was a uh, it was the um, 1983. Alpha Spider, which you know it was a great sports car. Oh I mean, boy, that I, was a classic. Isn't that the definition of a petrol head? You have to have owned an Alpha once in your life. Well, it was a wonderful car, and you know, I, before I bought it, everyone told me I'm going to spend all my time with a mechanic, and uh, it was totally not true. It was a reliable car, uh, you know. And at the time, I was really into windsurfing, and so people said, "How are you going to carry a, a, a sailboard on a, in a convertible?" And I rigged up this thing where I had a, like a bike rack on the back, and I rested the front up here, and I would ride around with my Alpha with a with a with a windsurfer on it. It's great. I it mean, sounds great. it sounds like I was living the California dream. It, it, it didn't really feel that way, but it was fun. I was working my butt off, but when I wasn't, I was going sailing and uh, driving my Alpha. Was it was it Alpha red? It was red. Yeah, of course, it's got to be red. Of course, it was red. <laughs> Yeah, it's very nice. So you totally qualify. <laughs> yeah. As but since then, I, I, I've owned some very, um, honestly, I've owned some very, uh, you know, functional cars. Uh, so in my middle of my life, I had a, a very embarrassed to admit I owned an Acura, which was, you know, it was a fun car, but it was, you know, kind of boring. Then it's I still had a, a nicer version yeah, of but, a Honda, right? But then I had a BMW 540, and that had a V8 engine. Well, that also had a V8 engine. That was a lovely car. That was an amazing. That was back when you know the BMW 5 Series was the king of the road. That, that car was just magnificent. It was a cruising car. It had a manual transmission too, which was just as an American that is great. quite special. Great. And then uh, when I when I got rid of that, I got my Porsche. Uh, That's right. So I had a Porsche Cayman. So you are a bit of a Porsche fan, aren't you? I love the Porsches, but. So we were considering getting you a Porsche, but for several reasons we just thought this one would be better. This is fantastic. I, I mean, I've driven a Porsche. I've never, I've never been in, I've never been in a convertible Mustang. Look at this. So, yeah, it's great. So, Bill, how did you get into dementia research? Wow, good question. Um, you know. I'll be quite honest with you. I wasn't really interested in dementia when I started. I uh, I was interested. So I was um, I'd finished my uh, uh, medical training uh, in neurology, and the hot thing at that time was PET scanning, and people were doing uh, PET scanning with O15 water activation studies. Uh, you know, Mark Rakel was at um, Washington University. So they would see blood Richard flow Fukovic. in the brain, basically. You see, you see blood flow in the brain with uh, oxygen-15 water. You develop these cognitive tasks, and you try to understand the computations that the di different areas of the brain were doing. This is what's now, you know, functional MRI has right. taken this over, right? But when I when I was just getting ready to learn about research, it was all it was, there was no functional MRI. So this was PET. And, um, and here it was Richard Fukoviak, uh, actually, who was really just, you know, taking the world by storm with his studies. So that's what I wanted to learn about. So I, I went to a lab in uh, Berkeley, actually, where they were doing PET. And, um, but let me just ask you say PET was hot at the time. Yeah. But, I mean, PET is still a scarce modality. What about so, back then? So PET, so I, I am, so I was an extremely fortunate fellow because I hit you'll appreciate this as a German speaker, I hit the zeitgeist of science twice in my career. The first time was when I just started uh, as a research fellow. Um, and that's, PET was hot because you could do O15 water studies, you could do FDG studies, right. but that's all we had. We didn't realize how limited it was because it was better than anything else. Mm -hmm. And you, with FDG, you could look at brain metabolism and relate it to cognition. With O15 water, you could do activation studies. and. So it was very hot, and I was very excited about that. And then, I'll get back to the beginning uh, later, but after about five or six years, um, then it, so then the big thing in dementia research, oh, well, let me finish the first part of my story, which is I did dementia research because that's what my boss told me I had to do. 
So you wanted to do reason. pet. I right? wanted to do pet, but he said, yeah, yeah, you can do pet, but you have to study dementia. And I said, well, I really want to do a study to look at language and figure out how people recover from stroke. And he said, you know, when you get your grant to do that, you can do that. Uh, but right now you're going to work for me and do what I tell you. So he if, didn't if quite say it in those words. If you it, could have done stroke research. If it weren't for him, I, I think I would be, have been more of a cognitive neuroscientist, maybe. But, you know, it, I can't complain. I, I mean, uh, uh, he really wanted me to do dementia. And the fact is that after, you know, a few months of learning about PET and dementia, I realized this was really, really interesting. And that, you know, I mean, right now we think of FTG PET as a fairly limited tool, but Back then, it was really opening a lot of doors uh, to try to understanding what was going on in the brains of people with with uh, Alzheimer's disease. So it was very exciting, and um, so you know, like I said, from for the first like five or six years of my career, I was working in a field that was very, very moving, very fast, and very hot. And then what happened was uh, molecular biology came along, and for the next like 15 years, no one was interested at all in in. in in FDG PET and Alzheimer's disease, it was hard to get grants. I, I struggled. It was not. Um, it was a. It was a real dry spell that went on for a long time. How did you keep your motivation up during that time? Well, well, you could still do interesting work. It was just hard to get funded. You know. I mean, I think there were still lots of questions we could answer. And of course, during that time, MRI came along, so we started to add MRI. And between FDG PET and structural MRI and functional MRI, there was a, a lot of interesting stuff uh, to be done. It's just that. Most people thought that the really important science was molecular biology and genetics, and so just getting funded was not that easy. It was just a struggle, uh, uh, but it was still it was still intellectually interesting. And then, um, you know, and then what happened, of course, is that uh, this is a beautiful street, by the way. This street reminds me. I don't know, I don't really want to insult any Brit Brits, but this street feels like Paris. This is the Champs-Elysees of, of, <laughs> of London. It, it, yeah. it really is a beautiful street. Probably might have to cut that out. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's lovely. So is it generally recognized to be a, a really nice street? Uh, not really, it's, it's recognized to be one of the highly polluted, most highly polluted streets in London. <laughs> <laughs> huh. Maybe that's an American's... Uh, Sorry, Bill, but maybe that's an American just talking about, you know, Europe. Yeah, it's I don't European. know. It's it looks, it looks, it's just a beautiful street. I think the no, trees are what... I love what driving up to this. I don't even know what that is. But I that's really a nice know. car. That's a, what it's are a, the AMG a, Mercedes, isn't it? Yeah. It looks like an AMG. The, uh, yeah, so then, then along came Pip, and then it got hot again. So then you could tell us a little so bit. So when about I say the zeitgeist, that, that was the second time that the world was interested in in uh, pet, right? Because it was, you know, the early '80s and then the early 2000s. Uh, you know, when PIB came along, then everyone realized, hey, you know, we can really do stuff with with, with pet. In fact, I, I, just to you know digress to go back to that dry spell in the middle. When I told people I did pet, they said, oh, I thought no one did that anymore because uh, MRI took over. I mean, that's what everyone said, you know, yeah. because because PET was known for these activation studies and MRI is way, functional MRI is way better than injecting people with O15 to do oxygen 15 water activation. So, um, yeah, so, uh, but when uh, PIP came along, I think all the, all the uh, naysayers who hadn't, um, you know, hadn't really understood what PET was, uh, figured out, oh, you can label interesting molecules and figure out where they go. And, um, and then, you know, that, the PIB just opened up the whole world of, of, uh, of uh, amyloid imaging and then, of course, tau imaging. And uh, it, it's, um, it's drawn so much attention, it's brought people into the field like, you know, chemists and um, uh, uh, molecular biologists who are trying to look at targets and develop ligands. So now we have ligands for you know, synaptic density. We have a lot of inflammation ligands. You know, they're all kind of problematic. But I think um, I think the field is just uh, finally uh, you know opened up to the point where people are really interested in making new uh, and developing new ways to image a whole bunch of targets. And um, so again, like I said, you know, I think um, I think in your career you're lucky if uh, if you hit the zeitgeist once. And you I, hit it twice. And I hit it twice. It was pure luck. It was pure luck. Uh, I. Uh, you know, but that was sort of. Um, you know, people I, say you have to be informed to get lucky. So I guess you have to be. You have to have something to be in that spot at that. I point. think you have to pay attention. You know, I think you have to pay attention and realize what's happening around you. And 
and take advantage of luck because, you know, it doesn't happen. That's why it's luck. But uh, I think, um, yeah, I think a lot of it is really not in your control. I don't know. And for, um, for the people at home who are maybe not neuroscientists, when you... Are there such people? There, 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 there <laughs> are such people, yes. What, what do, explain the significance of hitting the zeitgeist twice. What are these findings? What do they mean? Oh, well, I mean, you know, at the very beginning, we had no way of seeing what was happening in the brain. Uh, the only way you could have any idea of what was happening in the brain of someone with Alzheimer's was to do an autopsy. So first, PET scanning for glucose began to show us that brain function was changing. And we could measure that brain function change and link it to symptoms and sort of understand better how the disease evolved and progressed. We got better at diagnosing it and so forth. And then when the second bump came along, we were actually able to see the pathology in the brain. So it, it was directly able to visualize the, um, the, 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 the pathology that we previously could see only with a brain autopsy. So I think, um, so this was just revolutionary and, it, and the, it, it's now completely changed the way we study the disease. It's completely changed the way we do therapeutic trials because we can make measurements of how our drugs are affecting the brain pathology. It really was a, a, an amazing set of, um, uh, of, uh, of findings that, in, that have really changed the field. Now, you know, at the end of the day, it's all gonna come down to have we developed a, a treatment, an effective treatment, right? And we're not there yet. And I think, you know, there are... What do you think is missing? Um, I think, I think we're, you know, I mean, it's a easy to answer, very superficial answer. I think we're missing the right drugs at the right time. I actually think we might have the right drugs or some pretty good ones, uh, but I don't think they've been given at the right time. I, I, I think, I think we need to give them earlier. Um, and I think, again, with the next, you know, the next revolution that's already here is, you know, we can see the pathology with a PET scan, but now... We have some ability, and I think it's getting better all the time, to see some of the pathology, or at least get a hint about the pathology with a blood test. So if those blood tests really uh, work, then we may be able to start screening people who have evidence of the Alzheimer pathology before they have any symptoms. And I think, when I say early, I think that's what we're going to probably have to do. You know, it's been true for every single disease, right? You don't want to treat cancer after it's spread throughout the body, right? You know, you don't want to treat heart disease after a person's had a terrible heart attack. It's always the case that you want to treat the disease early. And we've never been able to even think about that with Alzheimer's disease because it's been completely out of reach. It's just been impossible to even conceive of being able to do that. But I think we can do it. I think, I think we're at the point where we can do it. And, you know, studies like that are going on now, you know. And, and uh, those kinds of studies, they're, they're in the early days. They're getting better and better. The drugs are, I think, getting better and better. I mean, I'm an optimist, so I think, uh, I think there's cause for optimism. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you, are you a natural optimist? Or do you think we're gen genuinely at a tipping point here? I mean, it's hard to answer that question because I'm an optimist. But I, <laughs> I, 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 really do, I really do think we are very close to a, a point where we're going to have effective therapies. I, I, I really believe that. You know, let me put it this way. As an optimist, I'll say, if I'm wrong about this, then we've got a horrible situation with a very long way to go. Because we really, we really have this sort of dominating idea about what Alzheimer's disease is, yeah. what causes it, and how it evolves. And I think that idea is highly credible, but it could be wrong. And if it's wrong, we don't really have plan B. So you mean we had a tipping point both potentially actually being there or potentially finding out it was all wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's already, a, 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 I mean, I shouldn't say already, for, for a long time there's been a lot of skepticism about the idea that measuring the pathology, in this case we're talking about the amyloid protein, there's been a lot of skepticism that that really is an important event in Alzheimer's. There are a lot of people who think it's not, right? And I think that, uh, I think it is, and I think the evidence is overwhelming that it is. But you know, the real test of that is to do an experiment, to manipulate something, right? We've been making all these observations based on finding associations between things. But in science, you have to manipulate something. Well, you can't 
give someone amyloid because we think that's bad. So the experiment we're doing is to get rid of the amyloid and see, see people happens. improve. And I believe that's going to be a, a positive experiment, but we've had a lot of negative experiments. We've had a lot of amyloid lowering drugs that haven't worked. And so that's caused the skeptics to say, you're on the wrong track. And we may be, we may be on the wrong track. My belief is that what, what the problem is we're not treating people early enough. Uh, but I think if, um, if we treat people early, I think we have a good chance of, um, uh, uh, of stopping the disease or at least slowing it down. But if, if we're wrong, then we're in trouble. I think we're in real trouble. Oh, we're going into a tunnel. We're I out. think now we will not be heard on the microphones anymore, so maybe we should just record the engine for a couple of seconds. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You want to hit it? Well, there's a speed camera right here on the right, so, <laughs> so you want to hit it? <laughs> no, he's, he doesn't want to get it. That's the camera, huh? Yeah. yeah. After that. Listen to that roar though. Okay. Now. Oh. That's enough to get you arrested. <laughs> Just the sound. I mean this car must have, I don't know, straight pipes or something, huh? If I drove yeah. this car in my neighborhood, my neighbors would throw things at me. And you live in North Oakland. Yeah. It's too polished for a car like yeah, this. Yeah, no, I could never have this car. Oh, wow. If we had problems with the sound from the Morris Minor, I don't know what this is going to do with the roof down. <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is going to sound like a symphony. Yeah, but <laughs> it's got like a big gun. So, Bill, you've been so loyal to Pet. You even, you, you stuck to it when MRI came along. You've been there for it with it all these and decades. And what has it done for me? Well, oh, a lot. Kind of, I can't think you've it's been very, very good, good to me. But what's happening now? You know, there's, there's biomarkers in CSF. They've been around yeah. for a long time. Now, I mean, when blood tests actually become reality, what's next? What are you going to do? Oh, oh, please. I mean, well, well, first of all, I mean, I think it's great the blood tests are here. And, it, you know, I don't know about CSF because just rolling it out on a large scale is, is kind of hard, I think. But um, I'm all for plasma biomarkers, and I'm all for curing Alzheimer's disease. So if plasma biomarkers can lead the way to curing Alzheimer's, that's fantastic. I'm, I'd be very happy. Um, but I think, you know, I don't think um, there's a lot of questions you can't answer with plasma biomarkers. I mean, take, for example, the other main pathology of Alzheimer's disease, which is tau. And uh, I think it's very important to know where tau is in the brain. Now, I mean, you could ask me the, a really a really cynical question, right? Which is, well, Bill, if we cure Alzheimer's disease, what are you going to do, right? Well, I, I'm interested in the brain, so I'll still study how, how memory changes, for example, and I'll try to understand what aging, how aging is related. I, I'm one of the fundamental questions in my lab is, how is aging, or how does aging evolve into Alzheimer's disease? Yeah. And I, I'm still, I, I think even if we can, even if we can really have a huge impact on Alzheimer's disease, I still think that's an interesting question that that if we can answer it, it, it may it may produce useful knowledge, you know? So, um, what, uh, what do you believe, so what do you believe, how does an aging brain differ from a brain that will eventually develop Alzheimer's disease? You mean, uh, well, I don't really understand. You mean, how does an aging brain that won't develop? How does a healthily, a healthy aging how brain, does a healthily aging brain differ from a yeah. brain that will eventually develop Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, I don't really know. I mean, that's, that, that's, I mean, that's a fundamental question. I, I don't really know. I mean, I think there's some easy, easy answers. Like, for example, um, I think, I think you can have a healthy aging brain and have tau in your brain. And I think maybe the amount of tau and where it is has some, and, and, you know, amyloid and tau whoop, have something to do with this. But I also think there's changes, for example, um, I think there may be changes in, in synapses with aging. And I think those changes in, in, in synapses could be driving some of the pathology, for example. So, there, you know, science is inherently reductionistic. So every time you answer a question, you generate another question. So from a clinical perspective, maybe it doesn't matter, you know, how does amyloid, or why does amyloid deposit in some people and not others. Maybe it's not that important if we have a drug and we can treat people early. But I think from a scientific reason, there's always another question, right? Which is, 
where's the amyloid come from? And why is it there in some people and not others? And why is the tau there in some people and not others? And why do some people live to be, you know, 90 and have intact cognition and other people at 90 get Alzheimer's and other people at 90 have cognitive impairment that isn't Alzheimer's, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of a lot of questions still to answer. And what would you tell some junior scientist that's just joining joining your life? You you are actually known to be a wonderful mentor to a lot of people uh, oh. in, in in the Alzheimer's world. And what what what, what would you tell well, someone? I, what was you, what was your mentoring advice to someone that joins your lab now? I mean, my my main advice is to find a question that you're very very excited about and stick with it. And uh, find a place that will allow you to do what you want to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, a, a supervisor or a mentor will let you do what you want to do. And um, just, you know, if you're not excited about it, either it's the wrong question or you're in the wrong field. One last question. What do you do when you're not in the lab? Oh, I ride my bike a lot. I'm a, I, I've given up cars. They're horrible, polluting things that just are going to destroy the world. Wrong idea and spell. <laughs> <laughs> just the perfect, just the perfect uh, point to end this interview, I guess. <laughs> I guess you should get out of the car. But when you made your big findings, did you genuinely have a moment where you were sitting down at a computer and you've injected the pimp tracer and you go, oh my God, this actually works? Did you have like that moment? Well, we didn't invent PIB, you know. I mean, it had already been out there. So, um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say we did in that way, you know. Um, but I have those moments constantly uh, in the way that, you know, one of the exciting things about science, you know, let me backpedal for a minute. Alzheimer's disease is not going to be solved by some single investigator in a lab somewhere, right? I think it's pretty unlikely that someone is going to like do an experiment and walk out and say, Eureka, you know, I have figured it out and now we've cured Alzheimer's disease. It's, it really is a collaborative effort that's gone on over decades. And so I don't feel that I ever did a single experiment that I'm, someone could point to and say, that's gonna cure Alzheimer's disease or that's the, that's the, you know, the key that's gonna unlock it all. But, you know, every time we do an experiment, we generate information, and one of the most exciting things in science is to look at what you've done and see how it fits together and see what it explains and see how it explains experiments you've done before. And, um, you know, people have described this as a, a moment when you understand something about the world or nature that no one else knows. And it's extremely exciting when that happens. And it doesn't happen that often, you know, but you do these experiments and every now and then you come up with a result that you think, wow, this really, we really figured something out. And know? was there a note, to, is, there a, is there a particular moment that you can remember when, when that happened to you? I mean, I, I, you know, honestly, I mean, I, I, it's happened more than once, you know. I, I mean, I can remember, uh, I can remember a, an experiment that one of my grad students did not that long ago that, uh, uh, was one of the best experiments we've done in a while and uh, yeah I remember look I, well I remember I was skeptical of her experiment I thought you know I don't think this is gonna work <laughs> and uh, and she was very uh, very very focused and, and did it and um, at the end of it you know she really had an amazing story about how tau spreads uh, from the uh, entorhinal cortex out through the rest of the of the brain, and I've been talking about this experiment now for five years. I think people are sick of hearing hearing mm -hmm. about it. But when I when she when she sort of sat down with me and went over the data and we looked at it together and we thought about what else we had to do, I realized, yeah, she's she's nailed it, you know. And um, yeah, I thought that was like a great a great experiment. I mean, um, yeah, I mean. There have been a handful of these times when I thought it was really... I, I mean, every time we write a paper, we figure something out, and it's usually fun and interesting. But every now and then, you feel like, wow, this is really, you know, a pretty major thing. So if I'm a middle-aged man, and I'm worried about my memory. Should I, should I have a, a tau pet scanned? Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> what should he do? Uh, get some exercise, eat well, get plenty <laughs> of sleep, don't drink too much. Uh... Okay. <laughs> but what if blood biomarkers now catch on and you actually start screening people in their 50s? Do you well, see a moral dilemma now that, you know, 
maybe we might be close to a treatment, but we're not sure. But we're actually close to being able to identify people at that stage. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> well, I mean, we don't have a we don't have a moral dilemma until we have a until we have a drug. I, I don't think there's a moral dilemma. I mean, I think, um, I mean, I think, for example, right now you know, there's been a lot of argument about should we tell people if we detect amyloid or tau in their brain. And um, for the longest time we didn't. But that's changing actually, simply because the ethics and the environment have cha are changing. And people, want, people who serve as research participants feel that they're entitled to know what's happening in their bodies. And I think scientists have come around to the view that, yeah, that's a totally reasonable position. So actually, more and more people are being told the results of their tests, even though we don't have a treatment, right? But that's a research subject, right? That's very different than going out and giving people tests. For, Do you feel this clinical. could be a first step into healthcare, government systems now preparing for this? Now well, that there are many tests that seem to be reliable and maybe are ready for implementation. Well, I mean, I don't think I don't think they're going to be useful for preparing. I think they'll be useful. I think what's what will happen, and it already is happening, is that if you know if we're able to detect, I mean, we are able to detect the disease and treat it effectively, then the timing of that intervention is going to move earlier and earlier. And then I think um, you'll just be in the same situation with a person who, say, is 50 years old as you are now with a person who's 75. First you do an experiment, you do a clinical trial. Mm. And the people who are 50 in the clinical trial will be in the same situation as people in their 70s now, that, which is to say that, yeah, maybe they'll get their results. And if the clinical trial works, then maybe we'll start screening people in their 50s. Yeah, and telling them, then it'll be a clinical tool. It'll move from you know, the research arena to, to the clinic. And then on your 50th birthday, birthday you'll get your colonoscopy and your uh, blood test for amyloid and tau. And what's needed now from, you know, funding agencies, the government, healthcare system to prepare for this? If we now had a treatment in the coming year or years, it, they have to prepare for that. Right? Yeah, I, I, I don't. You know, every healthcare system is so different, um, and um, uh, I think it's. I think the, you know, it's going to be very expensive. I mean, this was a big issue in the United States recently with the. FDA approval of aducanumab, right? That, um, and put aside the question of whether the drug really worked or not, it's a very controversial drug. Scientists don't agree of whether it really worked, but, you know, assume for the moment that it really did work, right? It's, you know, it was going to be very costly. But is it in the context of what Alzheimer's disease costs, healthcare systems? Yeah. Already. But, but, uh, it, 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 totally, you're totally right, but I'm not sure that the payers think of it that way. Health economists may think about it that way, mm. but that's not the same as the payers. I wonder what's needed to change that.